authors, though only one of the um, authors is here, and that's Richie Garrison. And Richie is a professor at the University of Delaware and the Winchester Program in American Material Culture. And his um, parent author, as Al Fang, is unfortunately unable to be here. And um, as Al Fang is the executive director of the China National Silk, Silk Museum, and I then will briefly share some notes on um, his paper. So, Richie, can you begin for us? Thanks, Sarah. This is uh, an opportunity to share research that has been bubbling around on the fire, so to speak, for a couple decades now. And it's, it's grounded uh, mostly in field work. And I did this intentionally. I've already written some of this up, uh, although it's a very drafty uh, piece of work. And uh, I thought it would be most effective today to sort of force you into the kitchen, which is both technologically uh, one of the most stable things we all do since our necessity for nutrition is embodied literally. And it's also in many ways very, very conservative because despite our notions of commodity chains and the ways in which food supplies have changed, uh, if you, when I ask my students about the kinds of tastes and foods they enjoy, they're often very, very traditional and based on what they experienced growing up. Also, in some cases, we're dealing with cultures in which we literally become allergic or non-allergic to certain kinds of foods, which are probably encoded genetically, though we don't perfectly understand some of this at the moment. So in thinking about the kitchen, I both wanted to look at things that went back millennia in terms of cooking with fire, and at the same time, to look at some of the technological changes that were taking place in a really critical period between basically the late 18th century and the mid part of the 19th century. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that the case studies that I chose are in any way representative of the broad changes that were taking place in either American society or, for that matter, continental society. I was intrigued, and I, this is kind of where it started, in looking at John Lewis Crimmel's uh, portrait of a young woman on the 4th of July, 1819, doing cooking over an open hearth in a Pennsylvania farmhouse. And at the same time, if you look carefully to the right, you'll see a 10-plate stove. Uh, which was equipped both for uh, baking, that's the reason why that door is on the side, but also warming the kitchen. You could literally cook on the top of that stove. And the, the challenge here is to think about why would you have both of these technologies in the same spaces? Why is the stove in effect disconnected? And while it's easy enough to say, well, it's the 4th of July, and if you've been in southeastern Pennsylvania on the 4th of July, you probably can imagine why you didn't want to cook over the stove. But at the same time, it's, it's a wonderful representation of a young woman who has a child sitting off in the corner and the problem of thinking about the ways in which these spaces are, are engendered, the ways in which this vast range of material culture is connected. I have to say that my thinking about this has been shaped most recently by John Law's book, After Method, uh, Masses Social Science Research and also uh, by Bruno Latour and um, most recently in Hodder's book, Entangled. And as I thought about the entanglements that we all see in the ways in which we cook, whether we go out to purchase fast food or whether we think about uh, how we build our kitchens, uh, I decided my approach on this would be essentially architectural to force us to think about the ways in which architecture becomes a kind of nexus of technological change and persistence and instability in terms of food waste. So these are, the, these are the four case studies. The one on top is the great mansion house of Delaware for the late 18th, early 19th century, the George Reed House, which is easily a prodigy house. It's probably the most single most expensive house built in Delaware at that particular window of time. The one beneath it, the Samuel and Olive Stearns house, he was a carpenter and a 30-something carpenter. So what becomes very interesting is these houses aren't just emblems of the elite. They're also representing certain kinds of strategic thinking that's going on on the part of the builders that erected them. The Mabry house down below, uh, it was built by an English molder who rose to become the superintendent of the Plymouth, Massachusetts Iron Works. And the one on the bottom is uh, George and Charity Stearns' house, although Charity had very little to do with the architecture since uh, George built it before they got married. 
as you look at the background of much of the technology here, what you begin to see is a sort of fusion. And because we look at the strategies that get published in many cases, we tend to take off from those publications, and particularly the illustrations of those publications, such as Count Rumford, which is sort of uh, in the middle on the left-hand side. But you can see these raised cooking facilities uh, in English country houses uh, in the late Middle Ages, uh, Apark is the building on, on the lower left, and right to the right of that is the stew kitchen, which is probably the product of the early 19th century, where you can see these kinds of things being designed into kitchens at a very, very elite sort of level, except that they also percolate down into the lower level. Rumford's famous roaster, which shows up, and, and Laura reminded me, I didn't include the Runlet May house and this sampling, um, and I just couldn't include everything. But the Rumford roaster is this major effort of uh, technological innovation and famous in Rumford's publications. It was also deucedly difficult to actually operate and required a certain technological proficiency that was probably beyond what most cooks could manage. Now this is mostly a representation slide. It's a complete fabrication at Old Sturbridge Village, and I make uh, no illusions about that. But it represents the kind, visually for your purposes, of the kind of open hearth cooking that was in fact endemic to the Northeast in middling types of housing. And it was in fact uh, emblematic of a very, very long tradition of cooking and food management and food storage preparation and <coughs> preservation and all of the other things that went along with it. I got into this in part because I had students asking me, well, how did the fireplaces actually change for preservation purposes? Mm -hmm. And in thinking about it, I also had been encountering over the years numerous innovations in these houses and the ways in which they were thinking about cooking. And this is the George Reed House, primarily built, despite the dates the Historical Society of Delaware likes to put on them, primarily built between 1801 and 183. Um, there were later additions, and the steam kitchen, which you see there, is one of the later additions. To the right is what looks like a bake oven, but is, was probably a Rumford roaster. We do not have time to go into how this actually worked. Um, but what Reed does is he builds this thing in at great expense. He has huge problems that show up in his letters, trying to find people who can actually construct this thing. And be, we know he understood what Rumford was about because he refers eventually to Rumfordizing his wife's bedchamber hearth uh, as a part of this. So he's clearly aware of these kinds of conversations. He was the son of a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He's very well educated and he's also very rich, at least by Delaware standards. He gives up in this constructed Rumford roaster and builds in a steam kitchen, uh, which is essentially what he's still using at the time he ended things. Did he need a steam kitchen? I don't know. He had a cook, an African-American cook, and he also had domestic help. We don't necessarily see this technology in many areas of the South, probably because people operating at the most elite level could hire uh, either trained cooks or enslaved cooks, they weren't hired, um, to do the work for them. So we do see these fancy kinds of kitchens in various places in the South, but not in many places of the South relative to what we see in urban parts of America. There's a long and very complicated history to the development of the cook stove, which I can't rehearse here, but essentially as you look from the left to the right, you're going from about 1807 or 11 to 1812, uh, that's an English model in the middle of a steam kitchen, and to the right, the first truly great and successful cook stove uh, in America, uh, James and Cornell's, William T. James's patent for uh, a cook stove dating to around 1815. So people are clearly experimenting with these kinds of technologies. Well, do they show up in houses, and what shows up in houses, and what shows up in houses, frankly, isn't cook stoves. Not at this period, at least. Uh, Samuel Stearns' house is most noteworthy for the sophistication of its storage facilities. And when we talk about technology, we almost never talk about things like storage facilities and how that enhanced or didn't the lives of women who were the principal operators of these kinds of kitchens in the early 19th century. And as you look at the basement, which is on the right of the Samuel Stearns' house, this, frankly, was built by a young carpenter who was 33 when he did it. 
I called him a 20-something in the paper, but he was actually 33. His wife was a 20-something, uh, with one child. Now, why did you need a storage system and a basement kitchen and a kitchen on the first floor in a house? This is the most sophisticated kitchen built in Northfield when it was constructed, and it was done by a carpenter, not by the town's elite uh, landowner. The Mabry House, and um, this is extraordinary in part because we actually have a landscape painting of the house on the left showing what the exterior looked like roughly between 1830 and, and 1850. But this has another basement kitchen, which was actually the laundry. Um, and you'll see a sink over on the left. There's a refrigerator over on the right. Um, yes, an 1838 or so refrigerator that was masonry and built into the building. I'll show you what it might have looked like in a moment. But upstairs, there was a main kitchen. This is a world in which people had really thought through the relationships of storage. We know there was a sink because the supply pipe was uncovered when the basement was rebuilt. The laundry is over on the right, and the ghost of the refrigerator is on the lower left with the uh, refrigerator that still survives at Shaker Village um, from the 1820s in Kentucky. I could not figure out what this thing was on the right until I actually saw the thing on the, uh, I mean on the left, until I saw the thing from the right in Shaker Village. There is virtually no literature on this. Uh, Catherine Beecher talks about it later, but not in the period when people are actually doing this. And so the ways in which very ordinary people are experimenting with this kinds of technology are truly interesting in all sorts of ways, but the forensics of it requires that you actually go look at the buildings instead of depending. You have to also depend on library sources, but you can't only depend on library sources. Now, in the case of Betsy Mayberry, this is the cooking hearth for Betsy Mayberry's kitchen. She was trained, she was older than her husband, and she undoubtedly trained in hearth cooking, and even though cook stoves were available, she didn't use them. I've got to move because Ivan's bell is ringing, but here's the George Stern's house. I could only figure out what was going on here by reconstructing the floor plans and seeing what lined up with the basement and what lined up with the kitchen up above. Uh, George Stearns was uh, a member of the Stearns Carpenters in town, and uh, we tend to get sucked into the parlor culture, which this building also talks about. But the most interesting thing to me about the house is actually the kitchen, because we know from the inventory for this house that there was a cook stove in the property. But you'll notice just to the left of the cook stove as we look at it, and this isn't going to show, but there's a bake oven. And part of the reason for that is that early cook stoves didn't really bake anything very well. And people built brick bake ovens if they had the wherewithal to do that uh, so that they could bake things efficiently. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, the floor plan of the um, Stearns house. And on the right, you could buy freestanding refrigerators. And that's what they were called. We call them ice boxes later on. But they were called refrigerators in the period literature. And you can see different kinds of cook stoves and refrigerators here. Point here is what we are looking at in sort of broad conclusions, and there certainly you could enumerate a number of others, but we're really looking in the ways in which people are thinking through patterns of productivity and convenience, much of it oriented towards women. It isn't only about domestic parlor culture, it's also about the ways in which people are working in these houses in very, very sophisticated ways. Secondly, we're looking about uh, the development of truly flexible, standardized appliances that could be swapped out. The problem for George Reed was when his elaborate effort to build a steam kitchen didn't work out, it was incredibly messy and costly to try to change it. And so cook stoves didn't last very long. They burned out. And they were also so hot technologically uh, in terms of their design innovations, that what was sensible five years ago didn't make any sense um, within five to ten years. And so people begin to shift to cook stoves in part because it's an appliance you can replace. Finally, when you get into things like ice, uh, not everybody could harvest ice. Um, but the ice in particular is about the development of capitalistic systems in which supplies of ice have to be distributed. We don't see an ice refrigerator built into the George Stearns house because I think in his case, he's in western Massachusetts. The Mayberries are in Plymouth. The ice shipments could come down directly 
into Plymouth Harbor and it's easy to access it, but in western Massachusetts, it's not until the railroad arrives and you begin to see the development and distribution of ice that takes us into that next phase of great technological change, which is really dependent upon this network of economic and capitalistic relationships where these kinds of commodities become available in a widespread way across the country. So that's the shorthand of the talk. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned, Ivan will just give us a very brief description of the South Wales paper and the ever changing technology it's with against the silk of the silk. Thanks. Uh, uh, it's, it's really wonderful that, that nearly everyone who's participating in this project is here. Um, uh, but it's a shame that three people are not. Uh, one is uh, partnering with Lambros Malafouris, Chris Gosden. They're writing a chapter together. And Chris is in India on a dig and can't be here. Uh, Bernie Herman, uh, unfortunately, has duties at the University of North Carolina that prevent him from being here. And Zhao Feng, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the executive director of the China National Silk Museum, was unable to come uh, from Hangzhou to join us. I should just mention that his name is in the Chinese fashion, so Zhao is his family name, Feng is his familiar name. Uh, so if I talk about Feng, I'm talking about him as if I was talking about Sarah. Uh, it's, it's a the other way around from the, from the Euro Convention. <clears throat> so what I'm going to say is drawn from the abstract that you've, that you've all had uh, and emails that he and I, uh, Feng and I, uh, exchanged. And here, what Feng is going to, to look at uh, is how silk changes over, the, the, the way in which silk is made uh, changes over time, uh, and he's not going to approach this in the way in which silk is usually discussed, which is the spread from China across the Eurasian landmass to Europe, uh, and technological change, development in, in, as, as one of spreading, but rather how this is waves of different technologies as they develop in relation to silk, back and forth. So it's a more complicated uh, uh, change uh, and a notion of stability and instability that has, is usually the case when silk, uh, the technology of silk is, has been discussed in the past. So he will look at the, at the earliest uh, silk production in China in, uh, during the, the Han period uh, in the second, second century BC, second century AD, uh, looking at sericulture in northern China and the, the, the uh, technology that is to do with hand reeling, uh, to do with, the, with dye stuffs that are available in that society, in that place, uh, multi headle pattern, uh, patterning loom, the use of that, and uh, a warp faced structure. This is from the abstract that you've seen. Then he will look at how uh, there are changes as this spreads to Central Asia and uh, look at the, the whole question of, of sericulture in which the silkworm is not killed. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a change. Uh, it makes it a more complicated thing, but it's, it, it means that you can actually increase the amount of silk that, that uh, can be made from any body of silkworms, as it were. Um, so then also uh, the way in which new uh, dyes become available. A lot of this we have to remember that silk is a natural product, if you like, uh, that depends on the availability of, of uh, the foodstuffs for silkworms, mulberry, uh, and then the treatment of the spun, uh, the spun thread uh, and cloth with, with dyes and mordants. Uh, so uh, he then moves on to look at, at a slightly different way in, in which silk is produced in southern China between the 7th and 12th centuries, uh, and the use of a, the, the, in, in, the introduction of treble control uh, for, the, for reeling silk, and then a further dyes being, being uh, produced from, of course, a different, uh, a different uh, natural environment from northern China, um, and also um, other introdu the introduction of other 
technological innovations. But again, this is a story that is not just one of progress or of change through geography that is purely a technological change. It's also change that is modulated through the availability of natural resources. And then, finally, he will look at uh, the European uh, adoption of, of silk and bring this up to at least the 16th, if not the 17th, and maybe even into the 18th century. Uh, and, of course, uh, European dye stuffs, which, um, which are, again, very different from what have been available uh, further to the east, and the development of, of technologies such as the jacquard loom. So this is, again, looking at a technology using a natural resource that involves uh, human manipulation, uh, human intervention uh, with a, 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 natural, a natural product, as it were, to, uh, to, to see how there's a, 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 an instability in this long-term human uh, interaction with silkworms in order to produce this uh, fabric which has such peculiar qualities. So uh, I don't think I'm really in a position to answer questions on Fang's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think, uh, but if there are questions that arise, I think it's really worth, as it were, recording them so we can forward them to him. Uh, because he wants to be part of this conversation, even though, of course, he's not able to be here. Thank you, Ivan. And so now we have some time, I guess, to direct questions to Richie and also question, connect Richie's work on kitchens with some of the work that Ivan has just outlined about um, silk culture. So would anyone like to open up? Yeah. Henry? Yes. Um, the question of movement. Yeah. Because I think that relates to both of the presentations. Uh, seems that uh, Fang's work is about the exchange that's happening over time and over space. Uh, so my uh, question on the kitchens is about the shift from the Indian you know, hearth to then these appliances that are movable or somewhat movable. And what, uh, what implications does that have for our understanding of a sense of family, a sense of place, a, a sense of rootedness as opposed to mobility in a changing American scene. Um, it implies changes in communication, uh, communication and ideas about newer technologies and so I want to keep up with the Joneses or I want to be ahead of them in the use of new technology. So, um, implications for changing communication systems and technologies and notions of family, the larger issue of movement and how that's expressed in what you've been telling us about this kitchen. Okay. I'm not sure there was a question there, but let me respond to that in the following way. I think the more I have studied this, the more complicated it all has become. And it, both at the level of the ways in which information moves around, and clearly some of it, Rumford is the perhaps classic case in point, comes when he publishes his volume, which actually comes out, um, the, the issue that, um, that Reed read probably came out in 1802. And he literally, we know from the restoration of the Reed House that there was a change order imposed on the kitchen because when the restoration was done, they've actually found the seams where he rebuilt a portion of the kitchen hearth and it was probably a botched job in part because the first iteration of construction was just too far along to do it the way Rumford had proposed and also I suspect because Reed's Mason hadn't the clue what um, Rumford was actually proposing. In other cases it's very clear that we are looking at a very widely di and diffused distribution of knowledge uh, on the part of all of the actors and the materials that went into these kinds of kitchen remodelings. Whether it is uh, the designers who produced these cook stoves or actually the workers who worked in foundries uh, who made the pieces that went into them. In the case of Joseph Mabry, he was an English molder. In the case of some of the design ideas, you're looking at people who come out of German traditions and bring them over. 
It's important probably to, to remember that it wasn't always diffusion from Europe to uh, the United States. Rumford himself was uh, born in Woburn, Massachusetts, and as a loyalist went to England and subsequently went down to work for the Count of Bavaria in Munich, and much of his design ideas were in fact based on what he encountered on the continent and at the same time what he learned from his ability to tap into the kind of various resources basically to reduce the cost of uh, the overhead costs of uh, the almshouse in Munich and the widespread distribution of people who are on what we would today call welfare uh, in, the, in the city of Munich and what, what he basically did was to incarcerate those who were beggars on the streets and to build these very sophisticated uh, systems in the almshouse that would, along with food recipes, that would allow them to feed them. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that this is immensely complicated, that it is always about things as seemingly simple as how do we pay for the fuel that goes into this. Most of the cook stoves were two-thirds less fuel intensive than using kitchen fireplaces. The George Reed house, this astonished me, actually consumed in the vicinity of 50 to 60 cords of wood a year to heat and cook in the house. That's a stack of wood that is roughly 7,000 cubic feet of firewood. Okay, he shifts to coal in the 1830s to anthracite coal and that would have occupied one room in the basement three feet high with the same amount of BTUs. So what you're looking at here, you can't simply create a, an understanding of these changes in the kitchen based on monocausal forms of social discourse. It's always about, as, as Hodder reminds us, it's always about the ways in which not only people interact with things, but the ways in which things interact with things. The amount of energy you're going to get out of a unit of wood or coal. The ways in which running water shortens the physical labor that went into the workers who operated these domestic spaces. The fact that you see real efforts encoded into the architecture of these spaces to lighten the labor of work. It isn't, in fact, only about more work for mother, as Ruth Schwartz Cohen famously put it. It's also about the ways in which husbands and others actually cared about how their wives and their daughters operated in these household units and how people could make their work less physically laborious, while at the same time encountering the very kinds of problems that the technology actually begins to create. That, however wondrous it might have been that the Maybury's had a refrigerator, it was in the basement, in the northwest corner of the basement, which makes sense from the management of cold, but at the same time must have been incredibly awkward to use. It's like those of you who have basements um, have to go down to the freezer in the basement to get stuff that you may have put down there for longer term storage. People were working these kinds of things out and they don't comment on them very well uh, because they don't write them up in their letters. They don't tend to put them into their account books or if they do put them into their account books, there are little snippets where you have to reconstruct fully the economic life of a family to really begin to see how these things interacted. I couldn't figure out where George, why George Stearns uh, had a well in his workshop in the basement. He was a carpenter. His workbench is still down in his workshop. But I couldn't figure out where he had a well in the middle of his shop because to me that would have been a deucedly inconvenient sort of arrangement thinking about it like a carpenter until I lined it up overhead with where the kitchen for his wife was and discovered that that was the wall where the sink was almost certainly located and the well would have had a pipe that ran down through his workshop um, up above to the sink that was likely in, in, her, in her kitchen. Uh, so the kitchen itself goes into why this, in a rural society, you wouldn't have had sideboard culture, why you wouldn't have had formal dining. These weren't people who were going to do a lot of afternoon entertaining as we build parlor culture notions. 
in urban environments. These were people who, if they entertained at all, were entertaining on Sunday or in the evenings when they maybe had the time. And they built their kitchens and they built their storage facilities around the notions of work that made sense for them. So to look empirically at that kind of evidence began to alter the ways I thought about it philosophically. And with that, I should stop and let others ask questions. Yeah. Just very briefly concerning Henry's really important point about movement and communication. Uh, Feng's uh, chapter is going, is, has the Silk Road in its, in its working title. So it is, he is, I think, thinking about how things move from one place to another and communication. Now, silk is a high value, bulky, but relatively light material. So it is something that can be, is that each, each uh, uh, bale, as it were, goes a long way in commercial terms. And I think one gets a real sense of that through two, uh, two uh, institutions. One is the Code of Honor, which was a, 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 a convention throughout much of the uh, Asian world uh, for, for many hundreds of years. Uh, and the other, the, the, the bestowal by a powerful person of a silk, often silk, not invariably, but a coat, on someone who that person wishes to honor. Uh, and the second, is recycling, and the recycling of, of silk textiles. And I'm thinking of the way in which, uh, say at Maastricht, the, uh, the uh, relics of St. Servatius uh, were wrapped in fragments of Persian and Byzantine silk uh, in the 12th century uh, to be placed in the gold reliquary. So these are little scraps of silk that we use to wrap relics. Mm -hmm. So I think this whole way of, of, of this question of communication is going to be an integral part of Fang's uh, project. Uh, Laurel also oh. has a hand. Yes. Well, there is a question. Yes. Well, I'll I'll take it. Where is it? 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 Also thinking about the ice, it seems to me, you know, maybe that if this is culture and technology, but I think in large measure technology in the initial abstracts and presentations was more on the engineering and physical sciences side. But thinking about the environment, about natural science, about those kinds of issues, the agriculture, the cow versus the axe. And so it seems to me a really important uh, theme to be addressed. I mean, you can't do all of them, but I was really glad to see that brought out. I do have a question. What does it mean to increase production in the kitchen? More pies, more people, and more fancy stuff. You know, I'm thinking of more work for mother. <laughs> that theme. So, how are you thinking about this? As you can see, efficiency, not increasing productivity. How would you define productivity in the kitchen? Well, in this case, I'm using what I think of as a fairly traditional uh, notion of productivity, Laurel, in, in which um, you're spending less time to actually do uh, the same particular process. But that's not what happened, right? Well, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not trying to debunk Ruth's observation about more work for mother. But what I do think happens is that women do, to some extent, buy time. And one of the most important was in something we so take for granted today, and that was running water. Okay, Not having to go to a well 
to draw water, not to mention if you've ever picked up a bottle, a bucket of water, you have an idea of just how physically strenuous that was. But you, but you while a boy it, to do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> we all know how well children are um, adapted to doing certain household chores, but what strikes me in looking at the field evidence is how quickly it depended on your location, but how quickly people adopted water systems into their household nexus. In the case of the Maybury house, upstairs there was a sink and downstairs there was a sink. There was a sink in the pantry. Cleaning. Cleaning I mean, is probably, Saving, cleaning, cleaning was washing. one of the big productivity gains and perhaps cooking on the stove, although that I think is open to debate. I think. It differed on where you were in, in urban households like those in Philadelphia. Most houses just didn't even have bake ovens because there were bakers in the city and you just went and bought your bread at the bakers. On the other hand, in these really small urban spaces, by the 1850s, they had parlor cook stoves which are designed for single people, widows, spinsters, and men who lived in quarters where they might have access to a chimney and these, these tiny little fancy Rococo Revival parlor stoves with ovens built into them where you could in fact cook with a boiler hole on the top so you could put a kettle or even a, a, a pot to do very simple kinds of cooking if you elected not to eat out. So I think we're looking at productivity to go back to your original questions in very complicated ways. And as I, I think about the opportunity of women to do a whole series of very important volunteer efforts in churches, in abolitionist societies, in education, in church Sunday school related activities in that early 19th century antebellum era, I'm thinking, well, where did they put their time? Yes, some of it generated more work for mother because standards rose but some of it was also a way to buy time by keeping things as close to hand as they could in their storage facilities, by making sure that all those cows didn't walk quite as fast, and by making an effort to systematize this, which is partially what Catherine Beecher is talking about, in a way that generates more time for some of these women. I don't know if I answered your question. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, this is actually a question for, for you and for Ivan. It was inspired by Richard's paper. Because, and I'm thinking out loud here, I'm just thinking about the stability and instability of, of things. Because it, what, one of the things that Richard's paper, Richard's paper actually points to two different ways of thinking about this. And one is in terms of uh, the built environment and the thing environment, where the built environment, to borrow John's idea, has a different temporality. Mm -hmm. um, it's really costly to have to change, swap out elements in the built environment, and, and the thing environment, and it, you can think of that as you can think of that as this, the poles of stability and instability. Yeah. Um, but the other element that he that he raised was this this whole element of what you might call form and expression, namely that the, in, in clothing regimes, for example, that that, uh, that have fashion systems, and not all do, but some do. Um, you can have a stable form, such as a jacket, that, that is constantly unstable. And it, it, it's not clear to me that, that these two ideas of stability and instability are the same. But you could you could make them. Um, you could make them turn out to be the same kind of stability and instability. I just wanted to throw that out there to see how you were thinking about this particular category of this of this book. If you don't have to answer this question, but because we're not supposed to put you on the spot here. <laughs> no, we should be yeah. put on the spot. And I'm glad yeah. you brought that up because one thing that I was thinking as I was reading through Richard's draft and then hearing him present today is that this is a, this is a new construction, yeah. right? And so this is an opportunity in, in, for him to talk about things being implemented in new built, new built environments as well as new things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, thinking about the topic of stability and instability could become even more tricky and potentially even more fascinating for thinking about how some of those built environments might be transformed through pressures from maybe the working wife and mother in that house saying, here's something that after working here for three years, I realized could make this better for me, or more of that um, iterative process, right? So we have an example here where we're thinking about stability and instability um, that is in some ways slightly neater, even though it's unbelievably complex. It's shown us neater than it would be even if we were talking about 
a kitchen, one kitchen changing over 30 or 40 years. Yeah. But, but it also, it also yeah. maps onto this other, this really important thing that comes out, which is modularity. In other words, yeah. the whole point yeah. about the stove is yeah. that it can become a, mod, a module in a larger ensemble. Yeah. And that's a very, it creates very different kinds of, of temporalities or stabilities or instabilities, because modular forms can be swapped up in and out, in and out as long as the whole retains its functional purpose. Yeah, the, Again, I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah. Just, the, the curious thing is that if we think about what we like and the taste of our food, that often is really stable. Yes. Right. And, and yet how we cook it can change very rapidly. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that process of thinking about, well, how does technology cook the food we actually like? So you can see at very high-end um, houses today, kitchens with pizza ovens. Mm -hmm. And you know, what is that about? That's basically an old-fashioned bake oven. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think people have them sometimes to brag about them, but not really use them. Because at a certain point, you have to cut the wood and put it in there. I suppose they buy wood to put in there. But at the same time, the learned skills of actually managing those bake ovens is, uh, is really challenging. And I didn't have time to talk about it, but the bake oven in the Mayberry house has a damper in it. It's designed like a cook stove, only it's masonry construction. And I asked a food waste expert, well, how long would it take you to actually heat that thing up? Because it's basically built like a stove with a flue system. She said, you probably could heat that oven up in almost to do usable cooking in about 20 minutes. So as, as you think of, you're looking at domestic kitchen productivity in ways that we don't very well understand because the technology is now so far gone that we haven't used it experimentally. And when you, when you look at people who are reenactors who do cooking in these kitchens, they're doing colonial kitchens. They're doing kitchens that have traditional forms of bake ovens and not these kinds of bake ovens that are really designed with the technology that is designed to use lower fuel levels, higher heats, and to manage those heats in very sophisticated ways. Mm -hmm. I know, um, here is a question, and then quickly Laura and Catherine. Just very briefly for Richie. <coughs> the question of the kitchen as an object of evidence, I'm wondering, to sort of establish that, whether it would be at all useful um, in a comparative context to look at the changes to kitchens alongside of the changes to other rooms in the house uh, so that we can specify as precisely as possible exactly what the kitchen stands for in a kind of cultural context. I, th I think we certainly can do that, the, but the more I look at kitchens and real-world buildings, the more complicated they are. And you do see patterns, and those are important to talk about, but you also see tremendous amount of variety. And it can change over time in ways that, that go directly to this notion that we want to design a form of technology that can be swapped in and out as conditions and needs arise. So if, if you've read, say, studies of boarding houses, and the ways in which single family houses get converted to boarding houses, they're often built on a kind of technology that is highly flexible. The thing we need to remember about cook stoves is as standalone units, they're highly flexible. Yes, they go obsolete pretty quickly, although they become stable by the 1850s. Um, at that point, most of them achieve modern levels of efficiency, and we can see changes subsequently, but they're not drastic changes. There's a tremendous amount of experimentation up to around the 1850s, at which point the technology really has begun to mature. In the earlier period, um, what, what is so challenging is to really think through how all of these technologies are interacting with each other, because they're related to food, they're related to fuel, they're related to access to water, potable water, and this is when you start seeing big metropolitan water systems become introduced, Philadelphia first, but subsequently New York. It really is interesting to see how it gets tied together in big systems approaches as well as standalone systems. Laura, do you want to Yeah, hearing Richie talk and reading your work and then thinking about the other conversations we've been having this morning, something that occurs to me about how your work and Professor Giles might connect is the concept of success with technology. 
that, and, and relating to stability and instability as well. That you know, a lot of what you were describing, especially with the early Rumford, is that it wasn't working well. And it was built into the wall. They had to move around it. He built the steam kitchen in order to work around it. And then he had to work around that. So what happens when technology doesn't succeed? And um, thinking about sericulture, the move, the long term thinking about reeling of silk, that that's a, a, a millennia old tradition. But all of a sudden, they're coming up with this new concept of uh, cutting the silk, <coughs> the silk from out in order to maintain the worm's life, which means you then have to card and uh, or comb the broken cocoon and change how you're thinking about technology and interacting with the silk. So maybe thinking about success and stability, might, there might be connections there to think about. It's useful. What is successful enough to get you to change a very long-held tradition and learn new practices? Exactly. So. Yeah, um, Richie, I just want to say I really appreciate the fine-grained texture of the study, and I think it's actually a great strategy for re revealing the complexity right, of the subject and the larger issues that it impinges on. Um, and the question I wanted to ask you about, I think you're very careful about this, and it's about the ideology of interpretation. Because in our discussion, better, terms like better come up, Success and anticipation, and I, I, I have also I've been trying to avoid the word progress, but these narratives of technological and social progress are so we you know it's it's almost unavoidable, and I feel like you've done a very good job of um, I don't want to say avoiding, but dancing with those those uh, those narrative frameworks. I'm wondering if you can comment about that. I think people define better and progress in different ways according yeah. to their life circumstances and uh, what they were trying to accomplish with the technologies they refused or adopted. In the case of Betsy Mayberry, she's older. She grew up with open hearth cooking. In the case of George Stearns, what's interesting about his house is he built that house before he married. His wife arrived at the house, and I'm sure he consulted her, but he also imposed certain technological systems on her. Um, as a daughter of a ship's captain who grew up in a very wealthy household, um, who may or may not have planned to be using some of this technology, but had to because he built it for her, and she arrived at the house and had to use it. It was very, very sophisticated uh, kinds of stuff. but. Uh, what I've learned is it's extraordinarily dangerous uh, to generalize too freely about this material. Even in those four case studies, you can see variations on themes that we, we really have to be cautious about saying, okay, it went from thus to so. Uh, the Mayberry's refrigerator was pre Catherine Beecher. Uh, in her discussion of ice boxes and ice refrigeration, uh, the first shipment of ice went out of Boston in 185, and everybody thought Frederick Tudor was a nutcase <laughs> uh, to ship ice to the tropics. But by the 1830s, it can ship to India. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at very rapidly evolving infrastructures of technological solutions some of which simply entangle people in capitalistic world systems in very complicated ways, they don't tend to make those decisions on the basis of what makes sense in some grand utopian scheme, but what in fact makes life different for those they love. Well, I, I agree, and I think your, your, your study really illustrates that. What I'm kind of I'm wondering is how much you want to are you interested in foregrounding your study as any kind of intervention? Or are you saying, are you putting it out there and saying, here's what this is? I'm still working on okay. this. Okay. <laughs> so, I was going to say a question about framing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Melissa, did you want to say something briefly on that? Yeah. Point? Well, and then we'll I'm on. Okay. Okay. Story, which okay. is kind of countering the story about progress, yeah. which is, um, this comes from an uh, interest I have in the, in the commercialization of ice harvesting again in the 19th century in Italy. And there are discussions about the qualitative difference between these old and new technologies. Yeah. So I would have, we, we haven't spoken about that, but say for instance in relation to nostalgia, I mean how these, what you're very interestingly telling is the story about this coexistence of these two different kinds of technologies, but the way in which qualitatively they mean something to the people that live in the houses in terms of smells, taste, and also sound in a domestic environment. It's, it's all we, I think that material culture scholars in general struggle with the cons concept of aesthetics and how aesthetics shape people's decision making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the case of food, almost all of us can articulate how things taste, what the aesthetic appearance of it is. 
and what we find appealing about it. And so all of these technologies struggled with the problem of making food that actually tasted as good as or better than or at least the same way as what they could get out of open hearth cooking, which had evolved over millennia. And I think that the standards of people's taste, and this was possibly encoded genetically, uh, were in fact defined by that millennial development of open hearth and fireplace cooking um, that goes back for the ages and the ways in which cook stoves had to ultimately be designed to cook as well as if possible. Now the bake ovens, what's interesting is that commercial bake ovens retain those masonry structures for doing commercial baking, uh, in part because of the nature of how brick and stone and other kinds of masonry structures actually bake things with various forms of radiant heating. The cook stoves struggled particularly early on most with baking. They didn't bake as well as brick bake ovens, which is why when George Stearns builds his house, he retains a brick bake oven, but he'll, his wife has a cook stove to manage because for her it would be both more fuel efficient and probably much faster to cook over that cook stove. Okay, so we're going to have to leave it there, even though I know we have questions from Anne and, um, and Denise earlier. So hopefully you can share those.